Job chapter 11. The Bible reads, Then answered Zophar the Naamathite, and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? For thou hast said, My doctrine is pure, and I am clean in thine eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee, that he would shew thee the secrets of wisdom, and that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up and gather together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men. He seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain men would, would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast, and shalt not fear. Because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. And thine age shall be clear as the noon, than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning, and thou shalt be secure because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety. Also thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee, but the eyes of the wicked shall fail, they shall not escape, and their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. Thank you, God, for this day, Lord. Pray, God, you use these words even now, Lord, to strengthen and edify your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Be ye steadfast, is the title of this message. Be ye steadfast. Now, as you're reading through the book of Job, yes, quite often you, you get a little apprehensive about what Job's friends are saying specifically. And you should be, because at the end of all, it says, God says, specifically to Job's friends, that they have not spoken right of me as my servant Job hath. So it's very clear that when... Job's friends are talking about God. When Job's friends are talking of him, you've got to be a little weary. They haven't spoken right. Whereas when you read through Job's statements, you know that Job was a perfect and an upright man. And you know that he was one that ensueth, that, that ensueth evil, feareth God, and embraces the good. But, again, it can't be said about them. But what you can do, and what I have found in reading the book of Job, um, is that... Quite often, what they are saying isn't necessarily in error in all cases. But what Job's friends quite often are saying is out of context. It's misplaced. It's directed at the wrong person. We know Job was perfect and upright. He was balanced. He was a complete believer in Christ. He prayed regularly. He read the word. He sought after God. He did the right thing. He offered the tithe. He did all the things that a good believer should do. And yet his friends condemned him as if he had done wrong. But, since these don't apply to Job, that doesn't necessarily mean that these statements don't apply to me. They don't apply to you. And so as I read a statement like this from Zophar, the Nehemathite, I apply them to myself. I read them as if, hey, I am not perfect. I am not upright. I am not Job. So these statements that he's making, though they're not always speaking right about God, they have not spoken right of me, the Lord said. We can take these and we can apply them to ourselves. Be steadfast is the message. Be steadfast. The definition of steadfast per the dictionary is simply this. Fixed in direction. Firm in purpose. Established in position. And those three points I want to focus in on when the idea of steadfastness. We as Christians need to be fixed in our direction. We need to be firm in our purpose. And we need to be established in our position as believers. Fixed in direction. Be steadfast. Fixed in direction. Job chapter 11 talks about this. Look in verse 13. 
If thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thine hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. Continues on. The thing that you notice here is that, is that he is challenging the people to be prepared. And that's what he's doing when he challenges Job. He says, Job, you need to prepare your heart. That applies to me. Hey, this may not have applied to Job, but hey, I need to be fixed in my direction. And I believe that is exactly what this topic, exactly what this context is talking about. Prepare thine heart toward the Lord God. Preparing means to plan. It means to endeavor. It gives you the idea that you need to decide and then you need to act. You need to be making ready. That's what preparation is. I'm going to be moving at the end of the month and I need to prepare by making ready my things into boxes, by, by planning the moving vehicles, by getting some help and assistance, by scheduling out the time off. I need to prepare. But what Job's friend here, Zophar, is saying, he's saying, if thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thy hands toward him, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away from thee, and it continues on, like I said. The intent here is he's challenging Job, he's challenging me, the word of God is, to stretch out, to prepare my heart, to stretch out my hands toward him, toward God. Well, how would you do that? Look at verse 14. It says, if iniquity be in thine hand, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacle. So we need to prepare ourselves toward God by putting iniquity far away from us. The more we turn to God, the more iniquity is by default put away from us. I think that needs to be the correct order of things. Prepare your heart. Stretch out towards him. If iniquity be in thine hand, put it away from thee. And that's the correct order because what do we do? We take our hands, we lift them up towards God, and his light shines upon them. We go, ooh, they're filthy. Ooh, they're dirty. There's iniquity on these hands. I stretch out my hands unto God. I'm seeking after him. My direction is fixed towards the Lord. Ooh, that light shines upon my hands. They're filthy. They're dirty. There's iniquity upon them. I'm to put that away from me. We're to get it out of our life. We're to get it far away. Verse 14 says, If iniquity be in thine hand, if the light of the word of God shining upon my hands stretched towards the Lord reveals iniquity, it needs to be put away from these hands. But look at this then. And let no wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. Now here's what we do as Christians. We get our hands squeaky clean. But our houses are filthy. Our houses are full of all the things that cause our hands to get dirty in the first place. And myself as a believer that continued smoking cigarettes well into my salvation. I'm sorry I didn't repent of my sins to get saved. Right? I continued smoking cigarettes with a Bible in my hand. For years. Right? But every time I put my hands towards the Lord, they're dirty, they're filthy, yikes, they're gross. There's iniquity upon them. And so when I finally said, you know what, the Lord wants this stuff gone, I'm putting it out of my hands. Too many times, too many times, I kept a pack in the freezer, just in case I backslide. Maybe it's rock music. Maybe you're listening to the wrong types of influences. And so you're like, you know what? I'm putting that stuff away from me. I'm a Christian now. My hands are filthy because of this music that I'm listening to. I'll put it in a box and put it in storage. Put all those CDs and records in there. Just in case I ever backslide. Just in case I want to listen to that old album again. No, if iniquity be in thine hand, put that away from you. But let not that same wickedness dwell in your tabernacle. Get it out of your house. Get it out of your home. Get it as far away from you. Destroy it. If we got books, if we got music, if we got, if we got habits, if we've got addictions, don't just put it aside and say, I'm going to be re removed from that for a time. You know, maybe, maybe we have a certain hangout that we go to with friends. Maybe we have friends indeed that are causing us to have filthy hands. Put them away from you. Sometimes as believers, we need to make the decision that not only our hands need to be clean, but our house also, our tabernacle also needs to be clean. We need to prepare ourselves. We need to be fixed in that direction, which is towards the Lord, and not let our dirty hands be so, but also not let our dirty tabernacles be so as well. We need to purge that stuff. We need to clean that stuff. We need to get it out of our lives. As we do, it's only because God is revealing those sins to us. 
through his word. And he's shining a light upon us. When you see something that is dark, just get it out of here. Romans 13 says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus and make not provision for the flesh. Don't give anything to the flesh. Don't provide anything to the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. If you have that sin that you're just going to try to put into the closet, you're just going to tuck it into a drawer, you're going to put it into storage, that friend that you're going to give a little space from but maintain their contact, that hangout that you're not going to go to as frequently but you'll still probably go there on special occasions, that family member that is, that is, that is, is, is wicked and a bad influence and you're, you're going to just stay away from them certain times of the year. But you're making provision for the flesh. You're providing the opportunity for your flesh to fall for this. But the reality is, is that we are supposed to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and therefore, that becomes our body. That becomes our what we are putting on and the provision for the skin, for the flesh, for the, for the stink, for the rock, for that thing that we're going to put away when we, when we rise anew. Right? That is the part that needs to have no provision for it. If we're covered by Christ, we're not going to fulfill the lust there. If we're in Christ, if we're trusting him, following him, believing him, letting his word lead us, we're not going to have provision for the for the uh, flesh, but we need to make those conscious decisions. Verse 15 continues, it says, For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. So if we are prepared, if we are steadfast, if we are fixed in the direction that we want to go, we will be, as the Bible records here, without spot. Look at verse 15. Then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Now I can look to God with washing hands. Now I can look to God as my direction and not know that there's provision for the flesh in my tabernacle behind me. Now I can look up to him with a face that is without spot, yea, then thou shalt be steadfast, and thou shalt not fear. Because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. And isn't that what we all want, is our misery, our sufferings, our problems to just pass away as the waters. Our addictions, our troubles, our strifes, our iniquities, all those things that just flow away as water that passeth by. We want to shine forth. The Bible says that we are lights in the world. And verse 17 says, if you're to prepare your heart, prepare your hands that are clean towards him, then thine age shall be clearer than the new day. Thou shalt shine forth. Thou shalt be as the morning, a bright and fresh and new, crisp morning as the sun comes up, as the light comes up. And that's what you are to be in the world. But only if you've got the right direction, only if you're steadfast and fixed in that direction. Verse 18 says, and thou shalt be secure, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt rest in safety. Safe and secure there. As you're fixed in the direction of God, you can finally embrace and feel safe from the struggle, safe from the torment, safe from the things that are attacking you, safe from the things that you're suffering with. And verse 19 continues, And thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Yea, many shall make suit unto thee. Suit is petition, sought after. Uh, people are coming to you. In other words, people see that your hands are clean. They see that your face is shining. They see that you're seeking after God. And this is when you get those moments where people say, what must I do to be saved? Because the world sees what has come to you, how you are steadfast, how you are shining forth, how you are secure and in safety, and they shall make suit unto thee. They shall come to you seeking. What do you have that I don't have? Why are you different? Why have you done to change? Who has changed you? Why is your life so much better than mine? What is this change that I see in you? And then you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's only through Christ. We need to be fixed in that direction. That fixed direction needs to be towards God. Look with me in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we see another example of a fixed direction. A fixed direction. And the example is that of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was fixed in his direction. Look in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. They did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? 
But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Amen. And they went to another village. So Jesus' face was steadfast that he would go to Jerusalem. The time was come that he should be received up, the Bible says, and he steadfastly set his face to Jerusalem. I like this. This is an interesting thing. It's almost like this whole cha chain or series of events happened just to teach these guys a lesson that he has not come to destroy men's life but to save them because he is so steadfast in his direction that though he sends his apostles before his face to prepare the way before him, the Bible says this, they went there to make ready... And that village of the Samaritans did not receive him. And here's the reason. Because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So he was so steadfast. He was so focused. He was so fixed in the direction that he was going to go to. That even though he'd sent his disciples to the next village. That when he got there and they were like, Lord, look. Here's the place where we're going to rest. He's still focused. He's still intent. He's still directed fixed in the direction of Jerusalem that he wants to go. In so much that his, the people that were going to receive him were like, well, he doesn't even want to be here. And they refused him. His intent isn't to stay here. He just keeps looking in that direction. They were to go to the next village, maybe. And the next village. Because the Bible does record that the next village received them. They went to another village after they learned the lesson that the Son of Man come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man came not to destroy men's life, but to save them. I just find it interesting that he was so fixed that even when he got to the hotel in that first, that first village, the hotel keeper didn't even believe that he wanted to stay there because he was just on his way. The disciples said, well, we should just consume these guys. And he's like, no, I'm here to save them. It's just interesting because you see just how fixed Jesus was on the direction. He was looking beyond that first village. He was looking beyond maybe even the next village. But eventually he found that village and they had rest. But his intent, his focus was beyond that. He was steadfast. He was fixed in that direction in which he wanted to go. We need to have that same mentality. We need to have that same attitude. Except our fixation, our direction, is not Jerusalem, but it's God himself. Next thing you want to be, to be steadfast, is to be firm in purpose. Turn to Psalm chapter 78. Psalm chapter 78. <clears throat> so Jesus' purpose that he was firm in, his direction that he was headed in, was that he was on his way to Jerusalem to save men's lives. He was there to seek and to save that which was lost. And then he was there to provide himself as the Lamb of God that would save all mankind. That was his purpose that he was firm in. But our purpose is different. Our purpose is Jesus Christ himself. Our purpose is the Lord. The Bible records in different passages, it says, Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. It says, Seek the Lord and his strength, Think his, seek his face continually. When thou saidest, seek my face, God, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord, will I seek. And that is our purpose. That's the purpose that we need to be firm in. We need to seek God. We need to seek to know God. Our purpose is him. Our goal is him. Christ is the ultimate goal. God is the ultimate goal. God is what we need to be firm, steadfast, fixed upon. Our direction needs to be Him. Our purpose needs to be Him. Amen. Seek God purposefully. Seek God on purpose. Be firm in that. Be steadfast in that. Not as Israel did, but we need to be firm, established, strengthened, looking to God alone. And that needs to be our purpose Psalm chapter 78 talks about Israel. Psalm 78 and verse 34. When he slew them, then they sought him. And they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock and the high God their redeemer. So only after he was slew of God. They were slew of God. Only after they had suffered. Only after they had fallen into wiles, into traps, into hurts, into hardships, then they sought him and returned and acquired early after him. Now, if you have that pause, if you have that delay, if you have that issue where you have forgotten God was your rock, you have forgotten he is your redeemer, early seek back to him. 
God wants you to repent, come back quick. But our, our Christian walk shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't have to be reminded that God is our rock. We shouldn't have to remember that he is our redeemer. We need to be firm in our direction towards God, always steadfast in that. We need to be firm on our purpose, and our purpose is God. Not just seek him in troubles. We shouldn't just have a mouth that worships God, but with our hearts we're so far away from him at all times. We need to seek to please him with our mouth, with our heart. With all of our desires, with all of our beings, we're to present our bodies living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, and that's your reasonable service. That's just reasonable. That's just accept. That's okay. That's the least you can do. It's the least you can do is present your body for all Christ's done for you. And when we have that firm purpose, when we have that direction, always settled, we're always pointing, just like Christ was steadfastly pointed at Jerusalem, and so no one believed he wanted to stay or be anywhere else. We need to be firm on God so that nobody in the world believes that we want to do anything else. No one, no one is buying that, that we have hobbies. No one is understanding that we, we go on vacations, that we do different things, that we have, have hobbies and goals and dreams and go to a job. Everyone is just like, man, your, your entire purpose, your entire goal, your entire desire, this guy's entire being is just God. Does he ever stop talking about God? Does he ever stop thinking about God? That's the Christian life. We need to be so fixed in our direction and our purpose to meet with our Savior and to know our Savior that the world just thinks there's nothing else you care about. Wow, all this guy cares about is God. And if you have that intent, if you have that desire, you're not going to forget that he's your rock. You're not going to forget that he's your refuge because he's always that to you. And it's not just when he slays you. It's not just when you fall that you seek after God, but rather it's always your direction. It's always your purpose. Verse 36, and it says, Nevertheless, they flatter him with their mouth. They lied to him with their tongues, for their heart was not right with him. Neither were they steadfast in his covenant. And what's God's covenant to the people of Israel? His covenant was always this, Do and ye shall. If ye will, I will. He would always, he would always give them a condition and then fulfill his end of the condition by giving promises. So if ye obey my voice, then will I bless you greatly. If ye will keep my commandments, then will I encourage you, strengthen you, lift you up, grow you physically, spiritually, financially. If ye will, then ye, I shall. And that was always God's condition. That was the, the covenant that was made. If ye will, then I will. And yet, they were not steadfast in it. For, in other words, their heart was so far from it that they didn't seek after God. They didn't want to please God. They didn't want to obey God, follow after God. They didn't want to have that purpose and have that direction that was God alone. And we get caught in the same traps. But aren't you glad, as it says right below that, verse 38, But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away. And did not stir up all his wrath, for he remembered that they were but flesh. So the understanding that God has about us is that, yeah, yeah, we mostly fall. We mostly forget God. We mostly uh, just just put him off to the side. We've got other things going on. We've got other desires. We've got, I'm, I'm so busy with this and with my family and with my job and with my hobbies and everything else that's going on. And then when suddenly all those things come crashing down and parts of your life fall apart and you feel as if you're slew before God, then suddenly we return. And I hope it's quick because right, our, our, our flesh is like that. We, we will turn away from God at a drop of a hat when something else comes out. We're reading our Bible and bing, a notification comes in. And now I'm on my phone, right? Just, just like that, right? But it's amazing how when he slays us, suddenly we're returning to him. And we ought to quickly. We ought to not forget that God is our rock and he is our redeemer. But I am thankful that even though I fall, as Israel falls, that he is full of compassion and he's ready to forgive us at that moment, though many a times I turn away from him. We're empowered to do so, though, as Christians. Our covenant isn't this same, if ye will, then will I. We have that same thing where God wants to bless us for our obedience, but we are empowered the more so in the New Testament to perform that. Turn with me to uh, 2 Corinthians, if you will. 2 Corinthians. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 
<clears throat> As you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, let me read for you Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And that needs to be our purpose as believers, as Christians within a congregation. Our purpose, our steadfastness, our ultimate goal needs to be to be in the Apostles' Doctrine, in the Bible Doctrine, in the fellowship, and in breaking of bread and end of prayers. As Christians, we need to do that within the church. Now understand that there was a church in the wilderness. There was a congregation within the wilderness. But how much the more when Jesus Christ paid for the church that we have now established by his blood and gave the church the Holy Ghost to empower them, there is so much more the ability, there is so much more the empowerment, there is so much more the steadfastness, not only of our own selves, but God himself in us working that which is good to stay in the doctrine and the fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and in verse 3 says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. So we're seeing here that there is a difference between the covenant that Israel turned away from, forgot about, neglected, and the covenant that we are now standing in. It's the difference between having a stony heart and a fleshly table of the heart, which is written upon. And ours is written upon by the Spirit of God. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. So there's that direction again. We have this trust through Christ toward God. That is our direction and that is our purpose. Verse 5 says, not that we are sufficient of ourselves. We should never think that. To think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. That's where we need to put all of our sufficiency and all of our trust. We need to understand that God is sufficient to give us what we need to do in order to reciprocate by pleasing him. Who also hath made us able, I love it, able ministers of the New Testament. Not in the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stone, was glorious... And why was it glorious? Well, we know it was glorious because it says here, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So what he's saying here is that there has been an intervention by the Spirit of God. Everything that they have continued unto this time. But what has changed is not the letter of the law. The letter is there, it is present, and it kills you. All it does is reveal to you death. It reveals to you that you need Christ. It reveals to you that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But the, in, the um, spirit then enters in and has taken that letter and now written it upon a fleshly table of the heart. And that's where this changes. They had the letter to read, to behold, to understand, and to try to do. And all that did was gave them death. All that did was had them reap wages of death. Now, though, the sufficiency which is of God entered into the church, entered into the believer, giving them from that point on that same sufficient all-powerful, will put you to death word written upon your hearts. What that does then is the inner testimony of the Spirit of God is now constantly working in you. So what happens is this. Yes, I do read the Bible and I do understand it in that way. But then when I go and I walk away and I'm living my life and I go, oh, that looks pretty cool. Who left this there? Put, Thou shalt not steal. Okay, the Spirit got me, right? The Spirit's there. His word that killeth is written upon my heart and the all-sufficient God is there to bring it into remembrance. He's there to bring all things whatsoever I've taught you to remembrance. And by doing so, he makes us able ministers. He gives us the opportunity to be able to minister of the New Testament. And our sufficiency within the New Testament is of God. And the same sufficiency was there, though the Spirit of God often just rested upon a person, and somebody could attain unto God in the same way. How much the more 
And that question is asked, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So if a man like Moses can seek after God, can fast and pray, and learn of his word, and receive the commandments, and come down, and people can't even look at his face because the glory of God is upon him, how much more shall our ministration through the sufficient Spirit that makes us able ministers of God, how much more shall that ministration be rather glorious? Well, the answer is this, much more. Look at verse 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, because that's, that's all the Old Testament did was condemned us, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. So the power comes from the Holy Spirit. The ability comes from the Holy Spirit. And that is how the Christian stays firm in their purpose. We will have a direction. Our direction is always towards God. But how much greater is it when our steadfastness is compounded by the steadfastness of the Spirit to please the Father, to have us to be like the Father, to lead us towards where we are complete in Christ, perfect new creator creations in the end, conforming us to His image. How much the more shall we have boldness, confidence, with that indwelling Spirit? Not just lighting up my face, but lighting up my every action. Because remember, Moses for a temporal time went up, received the Spirit of God, had it come upon him. People couldn't look on him. But that didn't last forever. That was for a time when they couldn't steadfastly look upon him. But how much more when that Spirit is not just lighting upon my face, but is lighting within me. That candle is lit and burning with inside me. That candle is pressing me toward the mark of the high calling of God. That, that candle is within me. That Spirit is within me, empowering me, trying fighting with me, encouraging me, strengthening me, leading me to all the things that Christ has taught me throughout my growth, throughout my walk, and doing that constantly and consistently. We are then fixed in that direction towards God, but now we're firm in our purpose, and we're enabled even the more so to do that because we have the Holy Spirit of God empowering us to do that. Be fixed in direction. Be steadfast. Be firm in purpose. Be steadfast. Be established in your position. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would. It's just a few pages back from where you are. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we need to be established in our position in Christ. We need to be resolved in that position. We need to be unwavering in that position. We need to understand by faith that we are established, secure, settled, not moving. That's where we are. And though our direction is Christ, and though our purpose is Christ, hey, your position is already in Christ. We need to believe that. We need to trust that by faith. I've heard it said many times, Christians don't fight for victory. We are not fighting. We are not battling. We are not struggling, striving, trying to get the victory, trying to win, trying to overcome. Christians don't fight for victory. Christians fight from victory. See the difference there? We are victorious. We are already winners. We have, the book is settled, the book is written, we know where we're going to be at the end of Revelation chapter 22. It's settled. So we are not fighting for the victory. We are fighting from victory. Our battle is from the standpoint of, hey, we've already won this battle. When the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. We shall wear a crown. And when the battle's over, we shall wear a crown. In the new Jerusalem, right? We are ready to wear that crown. We're already there. I mean, when the Bible was written, when John was standing with the innumerable multitudes, he looked out and saw each and every one of us. If he had the time to shake all the hands, he would say, Hey, Jamie. Hey, Yuri. Nice to meet you all. Right? He would, he, would, he would embrace us. We're already seated there as far as eternity is concerned. Christians don't fight for victory. We fight from the position of victory. And we need to be established. We need to be steadfast in that position. Look to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I shew you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, 
And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And thanks be to God, indeed, that giveth us the victory. Therefore, we need to be established in that gift of victory. Because it is given. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory in Christ. Inasmuch as we have received the free gift of eternal life, we need to accept and receive and embrace the fact that death is swallowed up in victory, and it is Christ that gave us that victory. Not only in regard to salvation, but also in regard to this sanctification process. Because we know from this chapter, from this portion, it's talking about putting off the corruptible and being raised incorruptible. Putting off mortality and being raised incorruptible immortal. Therefore, be established in that gift of victory through Christ. That offering is received. The earnest of the inheritance is received. We have the down payment, that down payment of the Holy Spirit and dwelling in us, giving us the foresight through the eyes of faith of that blessed hope. And that blessed hope is that immortality to come. The thing that Christians are looking for is not just the rapture. And people say, I'm looking for the blessed hope to be caught away, to be swept away from all of our troubles. Yeah, it's going to be a great thing. But the blessed hope is this, is that we will be incorruptible. We will be perfect. We will be as Christ. Our mortal shall be shed and we shall be raised in immortality. And through the eyes of faith... We know that even now we're in that position. Even now through the eyes of faith, we know that we have received that blessed hope. We're fixed in the direction where we're going to end up being with God. And God is the direction that we're aiming for. We are firm in the purpose that we are purposed to be with God, to seek God, to do God's good pleasure. And that's part of our steadfastness. The other part of our steadfastness is our sureness, our surety, our established position as a Christian who is settled in eternity. We need to embrace our established position, our position as victor, as conqueror, as one that is alive, alive, alive forevermore. Just as Jesus is alive, alive forevermore, we are in Jesus, we are in Christ, alive forevermore. And from that position, what can help you? What can hurt you in this world? What can harm you in this world? If you are steadfast in your direction, your purpose, and your position, and you understand that it's all about God and what He's going to do for you, and through you, and in you, and has done already. And you sit in eternity in heaven above. You sit in eternity in that great congregation. And what can stop you here? What can shake you here? People will fail you. Jobs will fail you. Situations will fail you. You'll fall. But that's all corruptible. Does that make sense? That's all part of the mortal world. But you need to be established on the truth that, hey, this is not your home. Heaven's your home. Amen. You're settled there. You're established there. It's finished. It is finished. It is done, 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 done. And though we are here toiling and struggling and going through all the things that we are going through, just rest assured that that blessed hope is that this mortal is put off and will be put off. You'll never have to think about it, worry about it, ponder about it, pontificate about it again. It will never bring you down because you will be raised in incorruption. You will be raised in immortality. And honestly, if you were to look at the Bible truth, if you were to read right through Revelation, you'd see that's not just somewhere where you will be. That's somewhere where you are. You are established steadfast in that position in Christ. Now, because you are established in Christ, God's not just going to sweep us up and bring us there and then it's settled. It's done. He has a purpose for you. Look at verse 58. It says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. So he just pretty much said, hey, you already have the victory. Hey, death has no power over you. Death has no dominion over you. There is no way death can conquer you. You are victors. You are champions. You have overcome the world in Christ. But then he says these, because of that, therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, 
unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So because you've already won, get to work. Because you've already overcome, get in the battle. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Steadfast in that. And if we're steadfast in our direction, our purpose, if we're steadfast in our position and we already understand that, hey, what's happening here is only to the purpose, to the end, that what happens there will be even greater because our labor is not in vain in the Lord, right? When we work here, when we toil here, when we struggle here. That's not in vain. So much of this world is going to be put off and it's all the negative things. It's all the stuff that you didn't even want anyways. When you come to eternity and look back, you're going to say, man, why did I need that truck? Man, why did I need that toy? Man, why did I need that that hobby? Why did I need that, that book? Why did I need that friend? Why? I didn't need any of that. Why? Because our labor was not in vain, only in the Lord. So we need to be steadfast in the Lord. We need to be unmovable in the Lord and in His work. We need to be abounding in the Lord and in His work. And as confident as you were in the day that you were saved, as sure as you were of the direction of where you were headed to heaven, and the purpose of which you were going there, the reason why you're going there, which is God Himself, and this established you were in the position that you had in Christ, even so, we ought to be having that safe confidence. We ought to be having that same confidence. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 14 says this, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So the beginning of our confidence was our salvation. But a lot of us let go of that. A lot of us don't, don't realize that though the sufficiency of Christ was there then, I'm trusting Christ only. I'm going to ask him to save me. I'm going to use the little bit of baby-sized faith that I have to just trust him. That that faith can grow and become bigger. But just because your faith grows and becomes bigger doesn't mean that the sufficiency has changed. Your sufficiency is still in Christ. And just as you were steadfast and confident the day you were saved in the God that saved you, you can be steadfast and sure and confident in the God that is still saving you, that is still bringing you closer to Him, that is still working in your life to strengthen you, establish you, helping you through troubles, trials, struggles. You can be safe. You can feel secure. You can be strengthened by that same God. Be steadfast in Him. Point your direction at Him. Make Him your only purpose. God is my purpose. Be established in the position that you're already in, in Christ, in eternity. This is all sufficiency. All the sufficiency comes from God. But here's, here's where we can really get this going. Because we all live in the flesh. We all have this current mortal body upon us. And that is a heavy burden to bear for a spiritual being. It's amazing when you think about what it must have been like for God to put himself into a mortal flesh. When you think about it, when you think about the things that, you know, as you get older, things don't start, they start working differently. They start hurting. There's aches, there's pains, there's, there's struggles. There's all sorts of different things that a body does. We're, we're weighed down by that. And by how our flesh, our body, interacts with other things around me, the circumstances, the trials, the, 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 the putting off, the, the, the struggles that we go through. It's, it's very off-putting. But remember, our direction has to be God. Our purpose has to be God. We need to understand that, hey, this is just for but a time. Christians don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We've already won. The battle's over. We're going to wear a crown. We need to be established though in those works. But sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we get beat down. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 17 gives you a rem uh, remedy for that. Ye therefore, 2 Peter 3, 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest also ye be led away with the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and ever. Amen. The knowledge of our Lord and Savior is what is going to help us through this. And it's all about him. The Bible is the all-sufficient word. And as we feast on that, as we feed on that, we become less and less at risk to fall from our steadfastness. Right? Because I can tell you all day long, look, look. Your direction has got to be God. Your purpose has to be God. Hey, you're, you're settled in, in God. That, that's your position. You're established. Don't even worry about it. But you'll walk away and have nothing but the corruptible words of a man just delivered them to you. 
The real growth comes when we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And how do we get more knowledge of our Lord and Savior? Through His Word. And that is where we need to put our foundation. That is where we need to be steadfast. God is not going to come down and just, boom, speak from the clouds to us. No, those days are past. Those days were for a select few. But we have a more sure word of prophecy Amen. whereby you do well to take heed. All right, this Bible is what's going to give you the resolve to be steadfast and to be purposed and to have the right direction and to understand that your position is forever settled in eternity. This is where faith comes from. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that's not just for the newly saved person on their doorstep. That's not just for the person at work you gave the gospel to and they received Christ as Savior. That sure word of prophecy, that revelation of himself is just as much for you, Christian, to be steadfast in. Point your direction, yourself, at him. Wash your hands. Cleanse your hands. And lift them up towards the word of God and allow them to reveal who you are. Be firm in your purpose. Be purposed to get up. And now that we've entered into a new year, maybe you've got a new reading plan. Be purposed. Be firm. Be ready to get in that word. Seek the Lord first and foremost every single day. And understand that this is your established position. You're not going to be rocked from this. You're not going to be shaken from this. And if you believe, if you trust truly that you've already won the victory, then, then the minor setbacks aren't going to bog you down so much. And that's where real growth can happen because we can trip and stumble. But hey, oh, the word of God is still there to catch me. I, I'm still picking up. And just like Israel did of old, they quickly repented and God was there with his mercy extended towards you. He said, welcome back, my son. Here, how about this verse? How about this verse? Here's strength. Here's encouragement. Here's everything you need. And God, through his word, will give you the resolve, and you will grow in grace, and you will know him more, and to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. I'll